Hey everybody, International Master David Proust here with your Week 9 Pro Chess League lesson. Today we're going to learn how to play the Queen's Gambit exchanged structure for black. Um, we've got a very, very clearly well-played game here by Grandmaster Mishanik, a.k.a. Alexei Serana of the Kangaroos. And um, this is just going to serve as a model game for you to show you a bunch of the different things that black wants to do. So the last thing that white's done here is they've played rook b1 and they're looking at the b4, b5 minority attack to try and create a weakness to attack on black's uh, queenside pawn structure. Uh, trying to use the extra half open file to create some kind of pawn that can be attacked better than the c6 pawn right now. But what does black do about such things? Well, first of all, I'm going to show you, or Alexei is going to show you, the importance of the e4 square. Knight e4, this is very, very often a square on which black's going to outpost a piece using the d-pawn and the e-file um, to support an advanced piece. And this piece is just going to be a strongly placed piece that's going to apply some pressure on the position and uh, take away some squares from the white pieces for maneuvering. And then we're going to see from him both a defensive technique and an offensive technique. So First of all, this tactically works because the bishop on e7 is hanging. So if white took on e4, then after pawn takes, the queen's attacked. If uh, bishop e7, queen e7 defends the pawn, and white is double attacked by that pawn and loses a piece. And if white uh, takes on e4, then bishop g5 also leaves white down a piece. So on knight e4, white's um, probably best, you know, white could just play bishop f4. He's not totally forced to trade on e7, but... Um, you know, if they play bishop f4, that bishop will also be a target for black to play you know, g5 against at some point and gain more space for a kingside attack. Um, so we'll just go ahead with the normal trade, and now white continues their plan with the minority attack. Now, in these positions, um, uh, black's main thing that they want to do offensively is a kingside attack, as I alluded to with the bishop f4, g5 idea. Um, so here, a nice idea for black at some point might be f5, f4, kind of like this minority attack would be the symmetric way for black to use the half open e file to create a target for themselves. The other option is to maneuver pieces towards that side of the board, you know, just bring the knight in this direction. That'd be similar to white, you know, trying to attack at these pawns with maneuvering pieces um, without making a pawn break. Um, you can also throw the h pawn here as sort of like a poke and see what that does to the white king side. So a number of different ways to try and eventually create an attack on the king side. We'll see how Serrano does it this game. But first, he's got to slow down what white's up to. Because if black just played f5 here, then white would play b5. And black is not going to have a target here as fast as white is. Um, white, you see, already has a rook that will threaten to come to b7 pretty quickly. And they're going to trade on c6 in a moment. And that's going to be pretty weak. Um... You know, meanwhile, if black plays f4 himself, um, white's not necessarily going to put a pawn on e3, but probably play like rook e1 with the idea of rook e3. And the knight on e4 is still needing some support here, so it's not so easy for black to, to fight on this file because the queen is there. Um, so that's just sort of like a little tactical detail, but you see that basically the two white rooks are getting involved a little bit better or faster than the black rooks, and the position is probably not that great for black. So first they need to employ some kind of defensive play on the queen side. Now sometimes that's done with a6 to slow down b5, but then white plays a4, and you have to have some next move in mind in the face of a4. And um, the move that I often look for for black in these structures is the move of b5, blocking the b5 from coming forward and establishing an outpost on c4. Now, my c6 pawn is horribly backward. I have no real option to control this square on c5. So it's going to get beat down unless I can outpost a piece on c4 before white's set and starts attacking the c6 pawn. So that's kind of like uh, the big idea there. Um, and basically, Sarana goes for a version of that. He plays b5 first which I'm a little less accustomed to than a6 first, but after white plays a4, a6, it comes to the exact same thing. And uh, white can consider the move a5 here to deprive this knight of the b6 to c4 route, but um, 
I think in any case, it's this other knight that's going to head to c4 in this particular game. Um, because uh, this knight is doing an important job keeping this knight out of e5. So white plays rook c1, which is a naive move, like trying to attack c6. But black's about to play his knight to c4 anyway. So it's kind of pointless to put this rook on c1. And white um, should find something more incisive here, such as moving the queen off of c2. So you can start threatening knight e4 without getting um, double attacked by the pawn on e4, right? So a move like queen c2, you know, maybe looking at this knight trade, um, getting your queen off of a slightly tactically exposed square on d3. Um, could be played, or the move I mentioned before, a5, taking that square away. Um, but anyway, rook c1 is played, and now knight d6 instead of knight b6. And the thing is, if, if black goes for knight to b6, trying to get to c4, white has knight e5, and white starts tickling c6 before black's totally set up to deal with it. White's threatening to take on e4 now in some cases and win this pawn. I mean, you have to calculate carefully the tactics around f6, but there could be a threat to win back a pawn here. White's already starting to attack this pawn before black's blocked it off. And if black has to play a move like knight c3 and then rook or queen c3, then this pawn is already just getting busted before black can really get a piece here. They can grab the pawn on a4 and trade it for this pawn, but the resulting position... Um, after something like this, is that their pawn structure is definitely weakened and white has good chances to use the C file as well. So that won't quite work out. So a very fine move from Saran actually retreating from his outpost on E4 um, because he's recognizing here the importance of this knight to stop knight E5 for the moment. And normally in the vast majority of cases I've seen the other knight head towards C4. So this was very clever thinking of him to use this knight instead. Um, White can't keep this knight out of c4 now and chooses to just trade it, uh, which is an interesting choice. You often see people say like, oh, that outpost is so strong, I can't trade there because I'll give him this like pass pawn. But by doing this, White actually preserves the option of opening the queen side with b5. So it's not it's not actually a terrible choice. The bad choice White really made was this next move, I think, which was putting the queen on d2. Basically, in this position, um, there are two things that white could do. One is to play b5, and the other is to play e4 to undermine this structure. Um, and at the moment, white's kind of threatening b5, um, so I would also want to play a move that's kind of threatening e4. Um, and to do that, I think the possible squares for white are probably these light squares with the queen. Additionally, you've got this pawn structure of three pawns on dark squares. So to me, it makes sense to keep the white queen on a light square where she's just going to have some more mo mobility than on, on d2. I don't know exactly what the advantages of going to d2 were, but I think after queen f5, queen c2, or queen e2, white's position is perfectly um, you know, acceptable or or normal. So... Um, you know, if I play like queen c2, for example, maybe knight f6 or f5 trying to stop the move e4 and b5, and we'll just trade it off for argument's sake. Now we're attacking this pawn here, and um, I think the difference of having the queen here, the extra control over the e4 square, the possibility of controlling f5, and the rook's doubling. White still has a chance to fight this position. Um, even though this pawn on c4 could be strong, there's still some chances against d5. There are situations where you can play e4, sacking the pawn, but winning back the pawn on c4. It still seems quite reasonable for white. So I would say this is kind of like a major mistake from white, and black responds with queen e6. And what this move does is it defends the d5 pawn so that black can trade on b5 when white plays b5. And you see... Um, in this case, black didn't need to prevent e4 because white didn't have the queen sort of supporting the move e4. Okay, so black's able to play this move instead of like the knight f6 move. Um, now white tries to threaten e4, but black has time now to stop e4 with the f5 move because they didn't need to play knight f6 to defend d d5 as fast. So now black has their sort of restraint up on the e4 move. 
but they've also played a positive move. The black wants to play towards a kingside attack later. So now white plays the same sort of structure change on the queen side, looks at this d5 pawn, but black plays knight f6 and basically has this f5 move included compared to the line I previously showed you that looked like this, where the knight had to come here to quickly defend this. Black doesn't have that f pawn. It doesn't give him the same control to stop e4, and it doesn't give him the same prospects to attack the king side like in the game. So here you've got the game. White moves a heavy piece of the b file, and uh, this is also probably a, a small mistake because it takes the queen off of defending the rook, takes the queen off of the e4 square, Square possibly compared to other squares she could go to. I know she wasn't on it, but it allows black to play f4. And it's not very good for white to take and allow back rank mate, but it's also not very good for white to play e4 and um, let black either just capture on e4 or even play the move f3 first, which we'll, we'll see this idea a little bit later, but the idea is we're threatening to basically just set up checkmate with queen g4. So you have to take that first and then take, and now we're sort of opening up a lot of, a lot of the king side. Um, so basically, black has found this moment where white can't take on f4 or play e4. It's a great moment to play f4 um, and get a nice um, position for black. Um, so yeah, I mean, white here... You need, needed something a little bit more defensive. Maybe the move f3, so that if black plays e4, in most cases you can respond with e4 yourself. And just since this is kind of like one of the very, very key squares that they're fighting over here, this might be a way to, to defend as well as possible, even though it does leave e3 needing defense. Um, that might be my best defensive suggestion for white sort of thematically to this position. So after black plays f4, suddenly black has, you know, a full attack rolling on the king side. White plays queen c1, defending the rook and e3, and black just adds the rook to e8. And you see now black doesn't need to overprotect this stuff, doesn't need to fight for the b file or anything on the queen side. d5 is well enough defended by two pieces that have the central space to switch to the king side attack. And no one else needs to worry about that, and black can put all their firepower with the rooks on the sort of center slash kingside side of center to also support the attack. So now black's ready to go for a final attack um, at some point soon, and white doesn't really have much going on. He plays rook b1 to solidify his first rank defense, so in some cases he could take on f4. He didn't have enough pressure on d5 anyway, so this makes sense. But here black finds a fantastic way to turn this strong-looking kingside position into an attack. You could pause your videos here very instructively and ask yourself how you would continue this position for black. How do you, you know, you've got your pieces on decent squares already, but is there a way to maximize them or improve them or target something? Or what? what's the next step from like you've built a good position to trying to turn that into something concrete? A lot of people know what a good position looks like, right? Like if I showed this position to somebody and said, hey, black's pieces are on are on good squares, you know, and let's say the pawn were on F5 instead of F4, so there, was, there wasn't this tension. Um, you know, so if we just imagine this position like here, right, and just play like rook e8 for black um, instead, of, instead of F4, um, you know, a lot of people could recognize like, hey, black's, you know, done a good job of blocking the C file. Their pieces are well-placed in the area where they're strong and uh, they're well-placed. But how do you turn that into something? How do you uh, make that concrete? The answer is with the move F3, striking at the light squares. And here again, we see the sort of like weakness of the queen being on a dark square here versus a light square. She's not poised to quickly come to the defense of the checkmate on g2, and she's kind of the only piece that could possibly do that. Um, she can't come to the defense of g2, so this is a quick checkmate. Um, if she takes on f3, she can't quickly come to defend the h3 or g2 squares either, like on f1 to try and defend that side of the board. Um, yeah, basically, since queen g4 with checkmate was threatened, um, white's choices are to take the pawn or to play h3 um, to stop queen g4. Um, and then 
you know, black can take here, threatening queen h3, so you've got no choice but to bring the king up, and, uh, you know, black can continue with the attack, opening the rook on the f-file, and now white's king is alone, defending two points that black can target. So black suddenly opened the position and found targets, and that's kind of like what it takes to go from a good position to, like, winning it, is at some point you have to pick, like, a concrete thing you want to attack, right? So black figured out, I'm going to attack the g2 square. But what I've just shown you is a transition where they then say, okay, having traded that and made the white pawn structure much less mobile and able to adapt and move, now I'm going to target f2 and h3 and aim at those squares. And uh, white's not going to be able to uh, defend this position, as you may imagine. Uh, none of the heavy pieces here are able to defend or attack these f2 h3 squares and the black rooks are able to lift at will plus the rook and plus you know one rook and queen are already actually attacking targets so kaput fini done so on f3 white chose to take it and then serana played queen to h3 and now you know next the queen could take on f3 uh recovering the pawn um, or depending what white does, black's next move, move could be something like rook e6, looking for rook lift possibilities, possibly with like a knight e4, knight g4 um, sacrifice next to just get the rook in there fast. Um, and yeah, I mean, white just can't summon enough pieces to the side of the board fast enough. In the game, he plays queen d1, trying to bring the queen, like I said, right, to cover some of these light squares. Um, but it's not going to work out, so I'll just show you one other line. Let's say the rooks obviously can't get there, so let's try bringing... The knight to that side of the board will recover our pawn for black and try and put the knight over on the side of the board. If knight f4, there's g5, so I'll put the knight on g3, and then black's just going to attack the f2 pawn and win it immediately, basically, like this. And it's just triple attacked, and white just didn't have enough pieces over there to deal with that. Okay, so winning for black comfortably. Um, so in the game, white played queen d1, as I say, defending f3. Now, how does black break through? If you saw my highlight video, you already saw this part because this is the the sort of flashy part of the game, the, the part that hits the highlight reel as opposed to the thinking man's pro chess lesson. But uh, if you haven't seen the highlight reel, here's a great place to test yourself again on your ability to understand the concrete your ability to turn strategic ideas into actual points in the chess tournament tables in your actual games um yeah so serana plays I'm about to tell you so pause the video if you wanted to think about it knight to g4 releasing the power of the rook um and it was clear that that knight wanted to move <laughs> um you know, I'm sure every move of the knight would have been good. Like, I'm sure I could just plop it on e4 without thinking about it, and it should be fine for me. Let's see. If they take it, then, I don't know, maybe the same ideas in the game of, like, rook takes f2, checkmating on h2. If king takes, queen takes, king up, rook check. I assume I'm going to mate this king, but... I'm just finding my way here, randomly making moves. Um, okay, I got it here. Force the king up one more step. Force him up one more step. Feed him each pawn on the way. And then do this, right? <laughs> All right. So, yeah, so this knight just needed to move, right? It could go anywhere. Knight e4 was winning, and, you know, I could also play knight h5 and quickly find some win for you guys. So... We'll stick with Serana's move, knight g4. It is certainly the most to the point since he's throwing the knight away, but, you know, aiming at the next two target points. Um, if white takes the knight, you guys already know what happens, right? Now this is like a basic test of your memory, right? <laughs> and checkmate. Um, so, yeah, rook f2, there's just no defense to this. Um, so after knight to g4 was played, white didn't take it and instead defended f2. So after queen h2, king f1, there was no checkmate on f2. Um, but now you can see that black is going to continue with this move that keeps the king from escaping. King to f1. And, um, 
Yeah, let's see. He played queen h3 check here, which is uh, winning the queen after king e2, rook f2. So white resigned. Um, and if you look at this position, this is kind of like the culminating position to see the power of the black pieces once they use the semi-open e and f files for the attack. And this is ideally what a queen's gambit declined eventually looks like for black. You control the e4 square, you play f5, f4, you get both your rooks to that side of the board, you're not stuck defending something over here, some weak pawn, and then their power can be felt in this kind of attack. So yeah, in three diagrams, we'll show you um, what black wants to do. We've got use the e4 square, right, to outpost and get some influence, start fighting for some squares. Step number two, we're going to play b5 and knight to d6 using the c4 square to make the c6 pawn not a problem. The position is going to transition, and we're going to play f5 and have the black pieces showing a lot of influence towards the king side. And then finally, we're going to break things open with f3, and you're going to see the power of the black pieces unleashed on those semi-open files. Absolutely strategically thematic. If you played the queen's gambit exchanged as black, you want to play games that are going to look sort of like this. All right? Memorize this game even is my suggestion to you if you if you play this stuff. Um, one or two games like this in your in your memory bank can really guide you pretty well. And uh, another suggestion is go out and show this game to a friend of yours. And if you don't have a friend, show this game to a chess player and you will have a friend. All right. That's all for today. See you guys later. Enjoy the final Battle Royale week of the Pro Chess League and into the playoffs.